it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Paula Giddings. So I first came across her book, When and Where I Enter, The Impact of Black Women on Race and Sex in America, when I was an undergraduate at Spelman College. And this book, in my opinion, that um, was written some time ago, is still one of the best analyses of black women's engagement with the intersection of race and gender and activism. It was through this book that I personally found the language with which to speak about my own experiences as an African-American woman, and it's one of the primary reasons which I went on to pursue a graduate degree in African-American women's history. She's also a former book editor and journalist who has written extensively on national and international issues, and has been published in the New York Times, Philadelphia Inquirer, The Nation, and The Washington Post. And we're excited to have Dr. Giddings here today because she's uniquely qualified to speak about the historical basis of many of the issues that we're going to discuss today. So Dr. Giddings, would you please join me on stage? I, I appreciate your very generous introduction. With the thought of that uh, coalitions and alliances are absolutely essential uh, to achieve what we must uh, in this country and globally, I've always been interested in these, thinking about these divides, uh, particularly around race, uh, women around uh, the issues of race. Women are usually read as white. Blacks are read as men. Uh, and uh, there is, there's, we've had such a hard time intervening in that idea around uh, scholarship and ideas around intersection, for example, which has been around for a long time. You know, intersection probably first uh, codified by uh, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and law theorists. I mean, the iconic piece, you know, was published in 1991. And we're still having these difficulties. Last night, I talked about three kind of events that made me think about this once again. Uh, one was a uh, documentary a film on the women's movement by the producers of The Makers. Uh, it was a narrative film on the women's movement, and I was a consultant. And believe me, it was, and you can ask me more about it, but how difficult it was to include in this narrative uh, women of color who were, uh, um, well, this, this is how, how I talked about it last night when we were going grappling back and forth. And so I asked finally, well, give me the list of women that you want to include in this documentary, and let's talk about it. And they gave me the list, and on one column, the list said feminists, who were all white women. On the other list was civil rights activists, <laughs> who were all women of color and black women. So naturally, a lot of the people that I wanted, the, the black feminists, intellectuals, and theorists, and activists that weren't in the civil rights movement drop out of the narrative. And so, again, the same problem. Uh, I talked also uh, about uh, how this uh, reading of women and blacks also came up again in the 2008 election, uh, when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama <coughs> were vying for the nomination. And if you read what uh, a number of uh, feminists like Gloria Steinem and Robin Morgan talked about, uh, it was a replay of the same idea. Uh, and there was lots of engagement around, around that uh, as well. And the third thing I started thinking about was uh, my Brother's Keeper initiative, which you might have heard of, which is a multi-million, $200 million five-year commitment uh, that President Obama uh, supported, supports. It comes out of the private sector, philanthropic sector, but Obama supports it as the one racial initiative, purely racial initiative of his administration. And this helped mentorships, et cetera, and this money is to go to <coughs> black and brown boys to the exclusion of girls in 2014. I still get crazy when I think about it. Uh, so again, but the urban crisis obviously is red, and the racial urban crisis obviously is red as male. Uh, and, and my thinking about all this, these are, these are all you know, progressive thinkers. Uh, and still we have this issue which seems to defy all logic. 
So when something defies logic, you have to look elsewhere. You have to look at, that Shelley was talking about, ideas around representation and, 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 other, and iconic and stereotype and uh, to, to try to get to the heart of, this, of these questions. And as a person who is interested in history, I started thinking about kind of the realm of historical narratives that may take us to these uh, places that we seem to, can't seem to get away from. And I thought specifically about um, uh, the, uh, uh, the idea of myth. Myth not as a falsity, but myth as a venerated story in which we learn, uh, 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 in which, in which gives meaning to the world. The origin myth is even more powerful uh, in this realm because it tells you uh, uh, how a new reality came uh, about and also sort of um, maintains a status quo, the origin myth, because it's almost sacred in, its, um, uh, it's, it, it, in the idea. And from there I went to the idea, and now what uh, I call, and there's a new book with the same uh, 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 title, called The Myth of Seneca Falls, the myth of the founding of the women's first women's rights movement in the world, right, as it's historically um, told. Reiterated again and again, I did the same thing in my own earlier work, in a certain manner, which, and I'm not, I won't go through, I went through a lot of the history uh, last night, but at the end of the Seneca Falls myth, uh, there are certain realities and certain frameworks and paradigms that seem to shape the contours of what we're still talking about, of, of women read as white and uh, blacks as male. By the time we get through the uh, conclusions around, or the meaning of the myth of the founding of Seneca Falls, of course, which no, Seneca Falls, of course, there are no black women there. Uh, at the very birth of the women's uh, movement, uh, it finally evolves into a, a competition, really, between women, white, uh, and blacks, male, over the passage of the 15th Amendment. Uh, and it is told in a way which, is, which, is, uh, 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 which confirms this idea uh, and this paradigm. And then I wondered, I'm getting ready to end now. Then I wondered, though, I start with, in looking at Seneca Falls, is this really the origins myth of the women's movement? And it's not, uh, there are a number of scholars who have been doing some such interesting work uh, in looking at this very question. Uh, and one of the scholars, um, and in fact, one of the organizers of Seneca Fall herself, Lucretia Mott, really, when she was asked by Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, about the origins uh, of the women's movement, Lucretia Mott says, you know, the origin of the women's movement it was in 1837 with an organization, the Anti-Slavery Convention of American Women. And I looked at that in, the, in my talk. I looked at that convention, and I looked at Mott's work, which is very different than Stanton's and Anthony's, by the way. Uh, and this convention was integrated from the beginning. Um, took on the issue, since it was abolition, it took on the issue as very interesting of women's rights within the context of a freedom movement of, uh, uh, around enslaved persons. And so, so almost uh, instinctively, there is this, this intersection that's going on within the very rich engagements within that uh, convention. Uh, also, the convention thought about how to bring men in the convention also thought about, and there were some uh, subsequent ones, uh, also uh, thought about, uh, uh, and Mott herself uh, did not believe that um, suffrage should be necessarily privileged as the most important element of the women's rights movement. That there were lots of other issues that were going on at the same time. Mott engaged with the Seneca Native Americans around what was happening with women then. 
uh, in the 1840s. The 1840s is a time of, of immigration. Uh, Irish women coming from the, from the, particularly from the famine in Ireland, there's a majority of Irish women coming over. Uh, who are in need of, uh, of, of issues, uh, lots of economic issues, working women, the mill girls in New England, the seamstress strike uh, in New York City, uh, issues of, uh, around, and of course, issues around African American uh, women who are also grappling, including the one person at this uh, conference, for example, was Maria Stewart. Uh, who a black woman, uh, abolitionist, probably, probably the first woman that has, speaks in public that we have excellent knowledge of. Um, she predates, if you know the Grimkes, she certainly, she speaks in 1830s, long before Seneca Falls, about women's rights and uh, abolition at the same time. So again, just thinking about the power of the historical narratives to shape how we think about uh, current issues, which is always something I'm very interested in. When you look at online activism, whether that be on Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, etc., do you see moments in which you see these same issues popping up again, or how do you think they manifest themselves in online platforms? I, I, I think they're, they're, they're pretty much replicated, but I have to give you, I have to have a confession here right now. Uh, I'm, I don't I don't look at a lot of, in fact, some of it just frightens me a little bit. And tell me if I'm wrong, I don't see how technology has a great impact on the shape of the narrative, maybe of the succinctness of the ideas uh, and the thoughts and the quickness, certainly, which is very exciting, mm -hmm. of, and, uh, and the diversity, as you, you've as been talked about, uh, can comment on it. The good news is that social media is more democratic. Mm -hmm. And the bad news is that social media is more democratic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Because there's lots of now other. So it's, it's, it's sometimes it's much more difficult, I think, to discern those who are who are thinking more deeply and sometimes even more serious about issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, that might be, you know, uh, a, a bias and maybe a generational bias. First of all, I think you have to decide if alliances and coalitions are important. Uh, if they are. Uh, then you have to figure out how to create them. And the terms of the alliance and the coalitions, I think you have to uh, think about and be very, very clear about. The idea that there's lots of talking that has to go on. I mean, even within you know, our, our own groups, there's lots of, there's, there's, there is al there's always negotiation. There's always negotiation. There has to be continual. Nothing is assumed. Uh, and uh, and this idea of you know where uh, the mutuality has to be part of negotiation is that the, that there does have to be a mutual uh, benefit, and there's nothing worse than the sense of betrayal of people who are supposed to be on your side. You know, you can take the enemy. You know, what I mean, you can that you know who can, yeah, yeah okay, but but the real sense when when you become disheartened is that people who are supposed to be your allies, who are supposed to have the same sort of objectives as you have, somehow uh, you feel betrayed by. And that's something that really does have to be uh, worked out, and it's hard, hard work. Ida B. Wells started the first anti-lynching campaign in 1892. She's exiled out of Memphis that year and uh, works, uh, goes to New York and eventually uh, is in Chicago and really uh, uh, takes this anti-lynching campaign, uh, you know, from New York to California and even to uh, England. Um, uh, and but she's also a social. Re she's also a general reformer, and in Chicago, she's a very important suffragist who actually founds the first black women's suffrage organization uh, in Chicago. When it's time for the 1913, and some of you may know, historians, there's a huge women's suffrage parade in 1913, a national parade. This is on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inaugural. And there's a contingent of Illinois women suffragists who go to Washington to march. And Ida's among them is an integrated group. She's a very important, she's probably the most important suffragist in the group. Uh, and uh, they're rehearsing of how they're going to march and the word comes in that no black women are to march with white women in this suffrage parade. The black women have to march if they're gonna march at all in the back of the parade. 
Uh, and it's actually to her, I guess, somewhat, well, certainly frustration, is actually a debate within the Illinois group whether to observe the shank sanction. And they come to a conclusion that they will observe it, that, they sh that Ida should not be a part of it. She, uh, I'm on first name basis with a lot of these people. That Ida, does not refer, that, that Ida should not march in that parade. Even though there was a debate, there are others who said she should, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what her pain about it was, is not just the exclusion, which is, was bad enough, but she knew back home that African Americans or other constituency in seeing this racism, she was going to have a hard time mobilizing blacks and black women and black men to women's suffrage as well because of this, because black men were sometimes fearful that black women would side with, co coalesce with white women against black legislation. Uh, so, so, well, I, I didn't, didn't, I'm going too long with, with this, but it's just a great, I have, I have these images in my mind, it's just a great image that uh, Ida disappears. No one knows where she is. It's time for the march. The women start marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, and suddenly, out of the crowd, Ida pops up and goes right into the middle of the Illinois contingent. And two suffragists who are, uh, who have been debating uh, and for her, immediately come to her on either side of her to make sure no one will interfere with her. Uh, and she marches down uh, the avenue. You do have to figure out if coalition is important enough to withstand it. Uh, uh, because it takes a lot out of you. Can I go back to this idea of um, you have to decide whether coalitions are important or mm -hmm. not? Um, can you share your personal thoughts on do you think that they're important? Oh, or do you think I think they're necessary. They're necessary? Yes. Okay. I can't think of an instance of a, uh, a, a major kind of uh, uh, important victory achievement that wasn't that didn't involve a coalition. I want to begin with uh, an African symbol, uh, the Sankofa, which says you need to look back before you you proceed. Um, it's an African mythical bird that flies by looking back. And so I'm just affirming the historical importance oh. of this conversation. Um, and so both black and white women are out there together. So once that issue, like for example, when the democratic uh, government came, it, it was like, okay, we've accomplished this. Let's go back to our comfort zones. And, and so you have, um, you know, feminism at academia, and yet the lives of ordinary uh, women hasn't changed. And so, they, so I, so, sometimes I think the disconnect with the communities that are suffering can be part of the drying up of ideas for feminist um, um, movements. Um, like I chair the African Women Theologians, and um, and so we find that we've also stalled because we got caught up in uh, academic research, theses, and disconnect from the grassroots. Um, and, and so somehow we need a history to say the grassroots women were also involved in the formation so that they become part of what we are doing. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank, th thank you very much. I was telling this um, story to, to, to someone last, last evening that um, uh, earlier, a group of us had come around the Million Man March in the same, being upset about the exclusion of women uh, there. And it brought together, we brought together a, 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 a wonderful group of activists, uh, academicians, grassroots. And again, a constant negotiation. You know, at some point, um, uh, one of the grassroots activists just raised their hand and said, will you please talk in a way that we understand what you're talking about? You know, it's about sites of resistance and blah, 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 blah. I said, oh, please, you know. And so you have to learn, you have to learn how to, to, to communicate more uh, and widely. We had debates about if there should be an all-black uh, organization or, or not. And, there, and that went back and forth. And the number, I remember a number of young black activists came to us and said, well, 
Our, our partners are white, and they want to come to the too. So, yeah, so you're negotiate. So you're thinking about all that kind of thing. So, but it's constant, you know. And you have to uh, always be be willing to uh, uh, to uh, calibrate. But uh, you, you gave a great example of uh, South Africa is just a, a, a fascinating uh, uh, example. Um, I was actually I was I was in South Africa as a journalist when I was under still under apartheid. Um, and um, learned uh, so much about what real what real courage, you know, what real difficulty and courage uh, could be. Because I interviewed, I'm sure you know better than I, but people who would go out every day and didn't know if they were going to come back, you know. And I, I I interviewed Winnie Mandela when she just came out of she had just come out of the uh, Orange Free State. And you know, at that point, she had been in solitary confinement. She had been tortured. She had been exiled. They let her back into her home in Soweto. The second day, she makes a speech against the government, all over again. You know, and that's. Uh, I know I'm going a little off topic, but from that, I learned what what real freedom is: is the freedom from fear. And somebody like Mandela, Winnie Mandela was not afraid the state had done, given her, done her the best shot. And she took it. Right? She wasn't afraid of anything. It also makes you an outlaw when you're not afraid of anything, which she is now too. But when you're not afraid, it's amazing what you can achieve and learning how to get past that fear. Who are the young women today you see that exemplify that fearlessness? Well, it's hard. To, that's a hard question. I get, you know, people ask me often, uh, who's the new Ida Wells and who is, and I, and I always hesitate. And I have friends who say, you know, you're supposed to name somebody so people feel, <laughs> feel, feel, feel better. Uh, but um, uh, the, the situations are so, the, the political situations are so different. Um, and... Even how to, I'm not evading the question, but even how to define fearlessness is, a, is different now, you know. Um, and it can come in all um, kinds of, of calibrations. I, I just wrote, and this is not to your question of, of current figures, but I was thinking about, I was writing a piece and you're from, at Spelman. If you remember Howard Zinn's piece on the Spelman young women who uh, become, this is in 1960, the 60s, and you know, Spelman used to, um, uh, Beverly Guy Sheftall is a very good friend of mine, Spelman, she said, you know, and she went to Spelman, and she said, when I went, they asked you to bring white gloves and a girdle with you. You know, that's how Victorian it was. And Zinn describes this evolution of these nice girls into these fierce uh, civil rights act act activists. Uh, and I thought about just beyond, and, and, and in that class was Alice Walker, <laughs> Mary Wright Edelman, Ruby Doris Robinson, so, uh, so what a group, huh? Um, and I thought about even those women who might not necessarily have um, confronted the physical dangers that we associate with a lot of those movements. But the idea that in this period of time, when you could finally become the first chance, this is when the middle class really begins in, this, in the 40s. You know, there's not enough black people with middle income to be middle class until after World War II. Uh, and these women had the choice of just going their way, behaving, entering the middle class in a secure, much secure way than their parents or grandparents, and everything would be fine. And they said, no, no, that's not enough. The rights of others is more important than my own immediate security. And that took a lot of courage. This lean in mess, <laughs> you know, this corporate feminism, oh, please, <laughs> you know. Uh, I understand the temptation, uh, uh, and not everyone, you know, is an uh, uh, activist. But, uh, but, uh, but I think it takes. But I think it's another kind of courage that we're seeing that people have to now. Um, 
uh, 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 racism for, with, and sexism within integrated settings is much more difficult to negotiate than trying to get in in the first place. I'm just so anti-corporate and anti-institutional. It's just, you know, because they're maintaining a status quo, you know, which is killing people, starving people, uh, and um, uh, policing people mm -hmm. uh, in terrible, uh, in terrible ways. So, uh, and 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 uh, and I guess I'm somewhat duplicitous saying that I work at an institution that actually treats me very well. Uh, 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 so uh, I'm, I'm not going to pretend, you know, I'm outside of it all um, uh, and uh, try to uh, provide correctives where necessary. We're in a world now, in the country now, where your economic well-being just about almost, it does. Your economic well-being in the United States now, I used to be a freelance writer. But now, you can't, it's hard to do it. Your economic well-being now depends on your ability to navigate elite institutions. And in that navigation, maintaining your integrity, you know, maintaining your fight, getting allies, boy, it's more than, it's more than an ocean women's economic well-being is based on navigating those institutions and I was personally really surprised that there has not been more sort of backlash against the sort of deification of corporate feminism. If you really need to navigate institutions, most people do. I mean where, how can people, I thought one thing you said that was very interesting last night is realizing that most people cannot be in a position to be activists. Cannot that the you know that the force of society really operates mostly to maintain itself. You know, for women and for men. I mean, how do we? How do you make that bridge? Everyone can be some kind of activist. You know, um, I remember it. Again, I can't, I can't help it. I'm a history person. I mean, how many, so many women, for example, uh, just refused to buy goods that were made by enslaved persons. Did you hear the? the this was sort of fun. Uh, they, there was a con one of those conferences you're talking about. There was a Microsoft conference for women. Did you did you did you hear about it? And they asked the new head of Microsoft, one woman asked, you know, how do you, like, ask for a raise in, in, this, uh, in, in, that, in, that, in that culture? Uh, and he said in so many words, you shouldn't ask for a raise if you're a woman, that people will remember you well for not asking uh, uh, for, for, for a raise and that you have to learn the, the culture so you'll get paid what you should get paid without having to ask for a raise. Well, everyone went wild, right? So, uh, so he's now apologizing on Twitter uh, for, uh, uh, for, for, for all of that. I, I'm a, and I, I have sometimes disagreements with, with friends who are much purer ideologically than I am. Uh, if people want to be in the corporation, uh, you know, what, what are you going to do? I mean, uh, uh, the thing to do is, and this is again where talk about why coalitions are necessary, because you've got to fight corporations. <laughs> yeah. You can't fight them by yourself. But you have to fight the, the bad things that they do. Uh, and I think there is some, and there's always the debate to the can you can you change from the in, can you change institutions from the inside versus from the outside there's always that debate going going on but i think some changes can be made from the inside and there are people who are trying to do that and i think that's good um, you know it's the same questions of should you be a part of any issue regarding the state or just stay outside of the state where do you, where can you affect the most change? Um, during the civil rights movement, I think the, uh, some of the most important things happened with a alliance of people 
from all from the inside and the outside. Sometimes those alliances are very short lived because then people have competing interests eventually. Uh, but uh, again, I think that there is I think there are ways to 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 think about that that just don't exclude a whole block of people from uh, how you might be able to make change. All right. So with that, we're going to wrap up. Um, Dr. Giddings will be around to ask answer more questions later. Oh sure. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so thank you for starting us off on this thank conversation, you. and we'll next welcome to the stage Feminista. Keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me not go out again.